So the, the objectives of this course is to reduce injuries and fatalities, to reduce rider, rescuer injury, increase the effectiveness of EMS, to focus on trauma and to address those difficult subjects. Uh, we do a rescue breathing technique called a jaw thrust rescue breathing instead of CPR because we're worried about spinal injuries as well of someone who's had a motorcycle incident. And uh, we'll also go into full face helmet removals by using two people to do that with, and then how we might move the injured. All right, so our agenda, we use an acronym, PACT. P for preventing further injury, A for assessing the situation, C for making contact to EMS, and then T for on how to provide treatment uh, to the injured with life-sustaining care and using the ABCs of trauma. At the completion of this course, we'll give you uh, one of these large, beautiful round patches in here and also a completion certificate. Your certification would be good for two years. Um, and then uh, we had stopped for a, sh a short period offering the advanced program because of COVID restrictions and things like that. It sounds like we might be starting to get those back again. And we can also let you know when the advanced program actually fires back up again. Um, so, like I said before, Hal Bender, Harley Davidson support, support, uh, provided this room. Uh, this program is also in dual, uh, recognized by the American Nurses, Nurses Association. They're not endorsing any commercial uh, products that are uh, maybe displayed during the presentation. We have some things that we use that are offered through Action Scene Management and uh, Road Guardians and some of the associated programs. Um, and I have some of those materials here. They're back on the back table, so if you, when we take a break and you want to look through those, uh, we're able to sell those things to you at no, I mean, I don't make anything off of them. They're offered at the same price that we offer. Um, online as well and in order to receive your completion you know we're going to ask you to complete that evaluation form and then I'll you know, give you your uh, patch certificate as well. Okay. Legal issues. So there's always many questions that people ask when we're talking about legal issues. What, what responsibilities do I have? What am I protected from? In Georgia, we do have a Good Samaritan law. It, it states that if, if you off render assistance to someone who at the scene of an accident, you, you can't be sued as long as you're doing something within your training or your abilities. Um, so, you know, the good, that would be the Good Samaritan law. Uh, you're, you're obviously trying to protect yourself. Or, you know, it offers protection to you, protection financially gives you the ability to offer assistance to the injured and also um, addresses any legal obligations that you may have. Um, and so here's a, a statement of it in that most states do have some form of Good Samaritan law. It may be slightly different for those up in Tennessee than, they, than here in Georgia. So you might want to take, you know, visit uh, your local uh, state site and or laws and find out what they actually state in, in regards to those. But also we, it states too that you don't accept anything in exchange for your assistance. That you're not going to be paid for that assistance. I mean that's what we have paid first responders for. Mm -hmm. Uh, some of the things that we do offer, like I said, is trauma packs. Um, so you've got a flyer in there in your folders about these trauma packs. Uh, they'll give you some details about the types of information that's in there. Because if you look at this, a trauma pack versus this, what kind of differences would you think there are between them? What, what good is this out there on the road? Band-Aids. <laughs> Band-Aids, right. That's 
pretty much it, Band-Aids. You know, and, and we're talking about some injuries that are probably going to be much larger than that, right? So you'll be wanting to have some, some type bandages, 4 by 4s compressions, and those types of things in your trauma kit, and that's what these are supplying you with, which are more uh, adapted to uh, when you respond to injuries out on the road. Uh, places you could get more information about these types of training classes. Obviously, uh, CPR training. Um, you can go through the American Heart Association, the American Red Cross, ASHI, motorcycle safety classes. I mentioned MSF and the Harley Davidson Riding Academy. Uh, Total Control Training is another uh, company that provides uh, motorcycle training as well. <coughs> there are uh, Abate in, in most states. Um, th those are usually uh, related to being able to uh, you know, address different types of laws and uh, restrictions that there might be on motorcyclists. And then uh, you can also take other types of training for medical responders or EMSs at your local college. So today's schedule, we'll be working with some written materials. I'll be providing some lecture with the PowerPoint presentations. We'll take do some hands-on practices as we go through this. We'll also be taking some breaks, lunches, and our evaluations. Let me uh, run this little video for you. began as a day of fun, a Hartford family out for a ride on their motorcycles when tragedy struck. But this story has a happy ending. In tonight's cover story, Vivian King tells us how a one-day crash course meant the difference between life and death. It was a beautiful day, sunny, warm. Dan and Chris Cronister and their sons, Danny and Dusty, were headed home after a day of riding their motorcycles when suddenly the pavement buckled in front of them. I hit it, flew five feet up in the air. She came by, her tires were about eye height when she went by me. I landed and I had full control of the bike, but Danny was dragging on the road. As Chris struggled to pull Danny off the ground, her front tire skidded on gravel. She and Danny were thrown from the motorcycle. He went flying and, and she just went like an arrow into the ground and, and they, were, they were done. Dan stopped his bike, checked on their youngest son, Dusty, who wasn't hurt, and ran to his wife and oldest son. I heard Danny hollering and crying, so I know he was alive, but Chris wasn't moving at all. And, and when I went to her, she was no pulse. He said I had no pulse. I was dead. There was really no time to think. Dan began CPR on Chris, and after several minutes, she began to breathe. He then moved to Danny, tending to his injuries with basic first aid. Chris was then brought here to Prater Hospital with extensive injuries. But she was alive, thanks to the quick action of her husband and the life-saving techniques he learned at a class he had taken just months before the accident. Dan was required to take the safety class because he's an officer in his motorcycle chapter. At the time, he didn't think much about it. Basically, I thought it was a way to spend an afternoon with, with my buddies, you know, and, and uh, I never dreamed I would learn as much as I did. But what he learned that day likely saved Chris's life. If he wouldn't have been there to take care of us, we wouldn't be here today. Chris says the accident won't stop her from the hobby she loves or appreciating her second chance at life. That's life. There isn't much you can do about it, but live each day and to the fullest and be thankful for what you have. For the 19th, Vivian King, today's TMJ4. talk about the first part of what we were going to cover today, which is preventing further injury. When you talk about preventing further injury, we want to talk about making the scene safe. You know, who, who do you need to be, first of all, be, be responsible for? 
yourself. Yourself, right? So you don't want to go charging into a scene that's not safe for you to enter. So let's make sure it's safe. Protect yourself by making proper precautions. What type of precautions do you think we would want to take? Maybe road flares to let people know there's something going on. Yeah, protect the scene. You know, mm -hmm. make make it the you know kind of quarantine off the scene at, at least at that point. What else? Contacting the EMS. Hmm? Contacting the EMS. Making contact the EMS. Yeah, but let's talk about you know a lot more about what what you are. I mean, there's been a lot of discussion over the past 12 months about us all doing what. Protecting ourselves, right? Protecting ourselves from touching various things or also spreading germs and things like that, especially with the pronouncement of COVID as well. Um, also, we want to try not to move things such as a bike or the injured unless you actually have to. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about those types of things as well. So it's also, should, should you, if you have hazard lights on your bike, turn them on? Yeah, well, I mean, you might use that to warn people of, of the impending situation going, going on. Uh, one bikes, but bikes you would want to not include into the scene are those that are not involved. So we want to make sure that, uh, that they're not actually in the, in the action scene. And we'll look, look, let's talk a little bit more about how we would do that. So let's have one person in the group take charge. It's hard to, to kind of protect this thing when people everybody has different ideals of how they need to handle situation. So someone who's been through a training class like this might be a person, ideal person to take charge of the scene. You want to make sure that those uninvolved vehicles are moved completely off the road, put the flash on, and that'll help others coming in that direction. Um, that there's something going on that they need to be aware of. Also leave at least 100 feet open on either side of the crash because you're going to be making that contact to EMS, and, he, and those vehicles need to get into the scene. So we want to be able to do that as well. Uh, we want to make ourselves <laughs> visible. All right. How would you make yourself visible? High-vis clothing. High-vis clothing, right. Um, in fact, let me ask Frank, why don't you come on up here? <laughs> and Ed, could you... Flip the light switches back there. Flat <coughs> jacket on. Yeah. That's, that's my goal. I mean, as as bikers, a lot of us wear what? Black, Black. right? So, are we going to see him if we're going down a dark roadway, as well? So maybe he needs uh, some gear to put on. <laughs> Might look like now he has a little bit of authority, right? Some, and we might be able to see him, all right? He might even need some more reflective gear. Um, is this the giveaway? No. <laughs> of course, he actually has stop signs and... Oh. <laughs> all right? He might even use a flashlight. help direct people and of course you can buy at a lot of places too sticks sticks and now make him a little bit more visible for others to be able to see cool. all right okay thank you so a few things that you could actually easily carry on your motorcycle that you could actually use and become visible to others And like I said, if, you, if you're interested in those things, we have um, some vests and some various types of reflective striping and then even the light sticks and things like that. So if you're ever interested in those types of things, uh, feel free to, to peruse through those, those things over there as well. Um, so send someone in each direction before or after the scene to actually control traffic. Make sure we're keeping that at least at 100 foot in each direction, uh, considering that, you know, 
there might be curves and there might be crests in the roadway and things like that. So if there's any, any of those types of things, don't have them just standing right over top around that curve or that crest of the hill because they won't be seen well in advance. Send them on past those areas as well. And then finally, you know, consider about posted speed limits. You know, if it's a faster speed, move them farther down so they can warn somebody well in advance. Because obviously we all ride at the posted speed limit, right? <laughs> <laughs> And you want to consider about, you know, if someone's coming into the area, about how much distance is it going to take for them to actually stop or slow down while they're coming in there. We usually use a calculation of take that miles per hour times four, and that's an estimate about how much stopping distance there's going to be. It actually becomes longer when you get over 65 miles an hour. And that's just something that I picked up from my riding academy training as well. Uh, but you know, when you get up to 65 miles an hour or 75, then we're talking about the whole length of a football field as being your stopping distance. So we want to be aware of how much t time that someone might need to stop. We also want to protect ourselves from blood and disease transmissions, right? There's been a lot of discussion about that now in the news. And things like that. Uh, yeah, there's been other illnesses that have been out there, but we want to be careful about how how those things are spread. So we want to protect ourselves. We look, you know, an ER nurse covers themselves from head to toe, and that type of equipment isn't used more than just at one time. So, so that's going to be disposable equipment. Now a biker, we do cover ourselves head to toe, especially in colder climates, but we care a little bit more about our gear, right? So you don't want to contaminate it as well. So we just want to make sure that, we'll, you know, consider what gets contaminated, what, what is used, uh, and then protect ourselves from any cuts on our skin and always wear gloves. hands on practice. Okay, so as you all came in, I asked for you to grab yourself a couple pairs of gloves. I'd like you to go ahead and put a pair of those gloves on and uh, help with no. And then Bob's going to come around here and give you just a little shot of shaving cream to contaminate your gloves with. <laughs> crazy with it. <laughs> Don't even think about it. If you're, you're taking off gloves, what you want to make sure, though, is you know, you're going to be in the scene wearing gloves, and, and perhaps you'll get them contaminated on the outside somehow. So you don't want to go, when you go through the process of removing gloves, let's make sure that you try not to touch yourself. So take your couple of your fingers and pinch on the, hopefully in the palm of the glove, that you can get hold of the glove on one side and be able to pull it part way off your fingers. Don't pull it all the way off though. No, actually, you know, pull it all the way off. Take one glove and pull it all the way off and ball it up in the other hand. Okay? Now you've got a clean hand that you'll be able to go underneath the other side. hopefully not get any of that 
contamination on you. Uh, get the trash can. Gotcha. Gotcha. Paper towel. Slow, slow to react. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so that way you can make sure that you're not, you know, getting the contamination on you. Now, what do you do with those? Normally, if EMS has got on the scene, you can talk to one of the, the first responders. They'll tell you where you can respond. Put that maybe on the back bumper. They'll have a, a maybe a bag to put that into. Yeah. It'll probably be colored in red or something. So that but used to be that we could actually pick those up at a local seafood place. But they don't use those anymore. But a red bag would indicate that it may be contaminated. And you know, then then they'll know that that's going to be something to throw away and not use. Okay? Um, but if you're wearing your gloves, what should you things should you not do? Face. Yeah, touch your face. Maybe reach in there, grab the phone. <laughs> or touch your keys or a pen, you know, anytime in your pockets or anything like that. Try to keep those contaminated gloves away from those areas that you commonly use. All right, so we're trying not to, to spread our germs, you know, our eyes and face, and try not to, to eat or drink until you actually go through and wash your hands. And just consider anything that you touch after that point, after you put those gloves on, may be contaminated, and you need to dispose of those contaminated things. All right. Gathering evidence. It's not our job to actually gather the evidence. It's more to protect the evidence a little bit. We want to not disturb the scene if we don't have to. All right. Um, so try not to move any of the involved vehicles. You could help maybe by gathering names and uh, witnesses inside your trauma kit. Keep a little notepad or a pen or something where you can write that out information. That way you can provide it to EMS or do a brick, quick summary of what you saw as well. If you take pictures, this might not be the thing to take the pictures with. Because if I don't have a memory card that I can hand to the police so they can do their investigation, they're going to take my entire phone, right? So think about it. You know, if you're taking pictures, maybe take have a disposable camera. They're usually pretty inexpensive. Make that part of your trauma kit as well for taking pictures. If you do have to move something, then maybe take a piece of chalk or crayon and be able to mark on the road surface like I had to move this motorcycle from this position to another position as I was trying to work on the person who was injured or where you may have had them where the injured person was where you had to move them to when we do have to move somebody we need to consider protect still protecting ourselves so motorcycles weigh at least 400 pounds or more at least right get up to our full dress Harleys and we're talking close to 900 pounds so, you know, if it's one rescuer, maybe you could get by with just lifting the handlebars a little bit, ease that pressure of that motorcycle off, off of them, or take a couple people and work together uh, <coughs> on the motorcycle as well. Um, you might have to move the person, so we'll, we have to consider different ways of moving the person, trying not to create more injury for them. And we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more here when we talk about actually moving the person and dragging it in place. Remember that your motorcycle has heat, right? The different temperatures that we might have to deal with on a motorcycle, obviously engine oil, brake rotors, exhaust headers, radiator coolant, and also brake fluid. You know, the boiling part point might get up into the 600 degree range. And remember that the battery assets and brake fluids are also caustic substances. Yeah. Um, some of the gloves that I 
provided here uh, are nitrile, which are usually a little bit more resistive to some of the chemicals and things like that as well. So you might want to consider that. Also, then you don't have to worry about latex uh, reactions that some people might have for themselves. Also, your motorcycles might have broken mirrors, windshields. You know, locate that engine stop switch. If it's still running, it's going to be over on the right-hand handlebar, close to the throttle. Um, you know, so try to use the engine stop switch. Otherwise, reach over to use the ignition switch. Don't be pulling the spark plugs. We don't want to create a sparking situation in, which might result in a fire. Watch out for sharp objects. Fenders are usually sharp. So we want to be careful about grabbing hold of a fender, grabbing hold of different tailpipes, or other custom parts that are on a motorcycle. When we get into moving the injured, if only, only if we, they are in danger do you consider moving the injured. So if they're in immediate danger, like perhaps there's still traffic going through the roadway, or the motorcycle looks like it's going to spark and go on fire, you probably want to move them away from that motorcycle. So otherwise, it's best to leave them where they are. Uh, if we need to move them, there's several methods we can consider. One is doing a log roll, where you actually have three people that roll the person together, and then you can put like a blanket up underneath of them and then roll them back onto that. <laughs> Batteries and everything. Um, That we, but we want to maintain spinal alignment as well as we're rolling them. So that's why you're using three people at one time. And we'll go ahead and cover that together. A blanket drag, sliding them on the blanket. And then an armpit drag, it's usually a little bit difficult to do. But then if we're able to leave them, if it's just you and that other rider, you may find that you're, you don't have a cell phone signal, so you need to leave them. So a play, position you want to leave them in is what we call a recovery position. We'll cover all this. So this would be a situation where if the person was laying right next to them, next to the accident scene, you probably want to move them, right? This was an accident scene in Georgia. There wasn't a lot of phone signal around there, and there was, you know, people still even standing fairly close to it. Would you say so? Yeah. All right. So log rolling and blanket drag. We have three rescuers. One rescuer is actually taking control of the movement of the patient and they're actually controlling the head. And this person is going to be issuing commands to your other two rescuers. All right? So you notice that he's got his hands located along the sides of the head. Try not to cover the ears because as he's issuing commands the, the person who's being rescued may still be able to hear those. You might need to talk to them. Okay? Second rescuer has one arm placed on the shoulder and below the hip. And the other rescuer has their hands above the hip and behind, above or below the knee. Notice how the two of them, their arms are kind of connected together. This is so that when they roll this person together, they actually roll together. Okay. A blanket drag will actually be working to slide the person. Uh, we want to move the head first if they're able to. So now you see, so now these other two rescuers are doing most of the sliding by actually using the blanket. Not actually moving the person around, but, but just the blanket up underneath them. So we got at least three people, if they're available, trying to make them as slippery as they are on the ground by using the blanket. 
an armpit drag, if it's only just one person, perhaps you can then reach up underneath of them, by the, grab around the armpit area, and use your arms to help them keep their head in alignment and drag them out. Um, you might need to put their hands in their pants. Or if you have another person, we can show you how you can actually use another person to help you out with, with dragging something. And then the recovery position. So we call that, you know, it could be known as a droop, puke and drool position. Uh, when someone has had a significant trauma to their body, it could be possible that they may end up needing to regurgitate something out. And so you want to make sure that they don't suck it back in. So with this position, we're placing the head and neck in, in alignment. We had just one rescuer who was able to put them in that position. But the head is being supported up on the arm. And then the arm is kind of in front of their face. So then you have an empty, empty area here if they should spit something up. And then we're also putting the kickstand down or a knee down. This is all stop, you know, as a person is leaning forward, they're then able to not roll any farther and rest there comfortably. Okay? So, let's go ahead and do a little practice. Um, if you feel, you know, we're going to be kind of close together, if you want to put a mask on or something, you're wel welcome to do that. Um, but we're going to go out here on the floor section and move, uh, do some practicing. What kind of life you need a victim. Anybody well, I was late, so I'll just be the victim. You'll be the victim? Yeah. <laughs> this is our apartment complex. <laughs> oh, yeah, the address they gave me. So, I hope you didn't have a Okay, uh, so I need three rescue. You want to take the head? Other way. Sure. Other way. Okay. Pass backwards. All right. So we're going to have Bob take, take the head as the lead rescuer. And then I need two more rescuers. Yeah, you take one All right, so, yeah, good, because you've got long arms. <laughs> Let's have you over, both of you over here on this side. All right, so, final alignment as well. Okay? Does the plan put this under him? Uh, or eventually, him yeah, the plan will be, well, what we're going to do first is to do a log roll, and then we'll be putting the blanket up underneath him, which I'll, I'll assist with that as well, as, as well as showing you guys how we would actually do that as well. Okay? So uh, right. go ahead and take control of the head. All right, I'm we'll sorry. have you come down here and place one, yeah. <laughs> yeah. one hand on the shoulder yeah. and then the other hand here below the hip. And then you're going to come down, go above the hip, and then kind of behind the knee. All right. So you notice how their arms are crossed here. You would all gather around here so you can see where they're at. <laughs> Okay, so then he's going to give like a three count for them to roll them towards him. Okay, all right, on three, one, two, three. All right, so they're trying to maintain spine alignment. So now they're able to get, now take a blanket and tuck it up underneath them. So only release one of your two hands in the middle. Do not release the hand at the top. Do not release the hand at the bottom. Okay. So, or he gets, or another rescuer comes and helps tuck that blanket up underneath. All right. So he can tuck some of the blanket there, and then put your cross back over and go back in position again. And I think we're going to tuck here. Okay. All right. So now he can give him a count for rolling back. All right. On three, one, two, three. Okay. And then you'll need to come on over here and pull out the blanket there on the other side. All right, you want to move on up here. 
afford the shoulder. All right, so now they want to gather up the blanket around him. So you want to go ahead and grab around, bring that up right along his head though. Keep his head up in the line. Okay. You want to get down and right fall in. So blanket up near the shoulder and maybe near the hip. So one hand near the shoulder, one hand near the hip. Okay? And then, as Bob is still taking the lead, he can then give him a count to slide him towards it. Okay, good deal. On three. One, two, three. Okay? So Norm, uh, but as you're keeping your hands up around the head, you know, just back up a couple steps and then slide. So it's gonna be more of just a couple steps at a time and not a lot of big drag, okay? All right, so there's a blanket drag. Anybody got questions about that? Is this good on gravel, this blanket here? I've actually had that out on asphalt, dragged it six times before the blanket failed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> See how strong, strong it is. I can, I can, I can huh? pull his it's whole body. Yeah. 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 In some trauma pants, or you can add no, it to like your trauma. 260. Yeah, so this I is this this thing. I'm trying to pull you. Wow, that's wow. impressive. Holy cow. If you had it to your comic, you wouldn't normally think it's really yeah. impressive. Right? Right. Jacket on would be one way you could do that is actually by grabbing hold of a leather jacket, get your arms in close, and be able to drag him a little bit. <laughs> Not much. <laughs> right. I find what, what actually helps to do this. Give me the blanket. <laughs> I prefer this method if I had to do it by myself. Take the blanket. Oh, that's what I do. Well, that's a good idea. <laughs> and now you have a little bit more to be able to drag with. <laughs> <laughs> so this jacket's sticking to the floor. Yeah, it's it. <laughs> it is. The floor it is. I mean, otherwise, you're going to be taking the jacket off. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Another, if, if you have somebody else to help them, you could then have somebody actually straddle and actually pick up a little bit at the belt, or even bend the knees, because the shoes can also cause friction on being able to drag the person too. So the armpit drag is not one of the easiest things to do. Okay? You know, what's, what's remarkable when I was learning this is, you, you ask yourself, how, where am I bike, where am I bike, am I gonna have a room to put a blanket? Yeah, and but then that's the size. Of that's it. Oh, I mean that's, that's and you see how they <laughs> that pull it together. Was, was yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I go ahead tried and pull that back up. Yeah, side. Yeah. Exactly. You tear that, you tear that <laughs> even if you try. Uh -huh. <laughs> this is pretty sturdy. Yeah. Okay. So there's. Different ways to move the person, but you need to remember that when you're moving the person, try to maintain spine. <laughs> okay? Now, recovery position. So just the two of us were out riding, he had an inc incident, and I need to leave him in order to go get help. So how would I do that? So let me take this arm here. I'm gonna put it up over the head. Go ahead and cross the legs a little bit. All right. Now I can then take and roll over here in this direction. All right. Notice now that the head is being resting on the arm. So that's helping pr protect that area. And take this arm and I can bend the knee and let him fall into this position. This is if he's unconscious. Obviously. Yeah, he probably would be unconscious, or he could be, still be conscious, um, but but you're not wanting him to cause additional danger. You know, just need to, to stay there and rest while you get additional help, or maybe even if you just need to go get some supplies out of your vehicle or out of your bike. But then we have this open area here that if for some reason something should need to come up, it's got a place to go and he won't suck it right back in. Okay. All right. Good. So I, I have a question. If it does, you, then what? 
Well, you're going. I mean, it's going when to you're stuck, I mean, what do you what, what do you recommend doing if the person does start puking? What what do you do? You just point? make sure that they don't suck it back in. You kind of put them in that position to. Yeah, yeah. Or roll them over if you. you know, no, well, if he starts over. puking in his position right now, you got. I probably yeah, probably right. would need to do that. Yes. Yeah. This yeah on back bad news. Right, because That's otherwise it comes problem. up and you suck it right back down. So you really do want to get it, so let it come out. Yeah, I mean you're not gonna you're not gonna stop it. It's it's happening. Right. So yeah. if he starts choking, then then what? Well, then you're going to need to address the choking. Um, would would you have to clean his mouth out and hit him on the back? I mean, what would you would you do anything to, to assist him? Uh, just. It, you probably wouldn't address it at the time of what it happens. Um, I mean, as long as there's not, it's not causing him to gag. Right. Otherwise, you're, you might have to do some type of yeah. hind leg or, or something like that, or or, some yeah, type, hard or, to or a tap on there. I mean, it's going to be it's going to vary depending on what type. Yeah, of it's hard to cover every situation. Yeah, I mean, that's it's, true. It's impossible. <laughs> the, but the more you, you cover it, the, the easier. It mm -hmm. will be. And that's why we, we go a little bit more into even our advanced course as, as well. We'll go a little bit more in depth into the addressing different, different type of medical situations. Yeah, like 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 in the dirt bike situation, he I mean, there's a good chance he might also have broken ribs and everything else. Then there's a lot of right, other treatments. Coughing up blood, yeah. I mean, there's all kinds right. of fun right. situations. Okay. Um, so we just kind of demonstrated for you. Is there anyone, any group of folks who would like to try to do this also? Anybody else? Just got a question. So when they wake up and they start fighting you to stand up, which happened to us the last time yeah. we were out. Okay. We were the first ones on the scene. And really? So, so you've been in this situation? Oh, yeah. He yeah. was, the guy was in a ditch. He was out for like three minutes cold. We could okay. hear him snoring. He was face down. You could oh, hear I him mean, snoring. You, you, so we you could try, blood coming out of his helmet. Yeah, all right. But you could try to, to tell him, I mean, you would rather him to stay where he is right. and not, not move. I mean, because you see that there, there's potential for more injury. If you get up and move around, we would rather let you hear him. We've got an EMS on the way. Um, but otherwise, if they're going to go ahead and get up anyway, well, I forcefully held him down because okay. his head was his helmet was cracked, and I had to hold his head for like thirty minutes for EMS to get there. So okay, was yeah. Cracked. So I mean, yeah, they I mean, if, 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 if you yeah. if you think it's to the point where you have to forcefully keep him there, then I mean, that was probably the best thing to do. Yeah. I mean, uh, I just, I just kind of because other, I uh, held his head, but then just yeah. kept. Well, then we would get into we would, so we would get, get into the situation of talking about implied consent you know because he's taking the consent away from you to do what he wants to do right but then hang around because at some point when he does pass out you have implied consent to go back and assist again okay because okay? because a normal sane person would be wanting you to do something for them so that we would talk about implied consent okay anybody want to try to some of these what, 10 minutes for a break? Let's talk about more about assessing the situation. So when you're coming into the scene, you want to actually, you know, when you arrive on it, start doing your assessment and considering what's going on at that, at that accident scene. So how would we assess the situation? Well, the situation will be able to tell you the way that the crash may have actually occurred. We'll give you some types of clues about the types the kind and severities of injuries you might suspect you'll come up on. And then also the mechanisms of injury will give you some clues that you need to look at beyond the immediate picture. You can also follow. All right, so we're gonna talk about this two, these two cycles things as we assess the situation. Injuries are usually right. caused by deceleration and by compression, all right? Consider when you're coming, an accident, you'll be coming at, you know, all of a sudden you'll see what you might be running into. So you'll either start to slow down, and then once you make that impact, that's where we're going to actually see compression come involved as well. All right. Obviously, we've got a little bit of science here. A body in motion tends to remain in motion until acted upon by an outside force. So either that wall or that car that you hit, and then also the force of impact is usually the sum of the speeds at the time of impact. So if you're the only thing traveling, at least you only have your speed to go by instead of something coming at you. If you have something coming at you, then you'll have to add in that amount of speed as well. A couple examples. Uh, you know, 
motorcycle inside the middle of a car. Yeah. Riders who have been racing, one has gone down. He's probably still moving in that direction a little bit, but then the rider behind him has impacted with him. And then down below, a car was at an intersection and a motorcycle hit at the side. So the motorcycle has actually stopped, it hit the car, but now the, the rider continued off the motorcycle and now is traveling across the top of the car. So three separate types of crashes. Now the vehicle comes in contact with something, the occupants are coming in contact with something, and then the internal organs may continue to move after you come in contact. So consider that. Your vehicle is stopped, but you're still going to travel in, in the direction that the vehicle was traveling if you were traveling with it. Then finally you come in contact with something to stop you, but now inside of you still is traveling until it actually comes to contact with your rib cage or, or external skin. In motorcycle crashes, we tend to see four particular types, either a head-on crash, an angular crash where you deflect off something, or laying the bike down, which, you know, it, I, I teach this in my riding class, laying the bike down is not normally the way you need to stop your bike. You know, you need to try to ride it to, to, to a stop. And then ejection, when you actually become uh, a separate object from the motorcycle itself. So, head-on collisions. What type of injuries would you think you would maybe see from a head-on collision? Concussion? Neck. Uh, a neck yeah. injury, maybe? Neck Concussion, spine, perhaps? Yeah. Okay. Back. Hmm? Your, back, your back. Maybe your back? Okay. Maybe arm injuries as they brace. As they brace as well, or or actually they, you know, in, in this case, this guy's landing on top of a hood, right? So he might actually injure his arms as he actually hits on the car as, as well. So one of the things you might not consider is as you're actually leaving the motorcycle, how about your legs? Will they always cure the leg, the handlebars right away? They could get caught up in those handlebars. So we may end up seeing cases where femur fractures or bone breakages as, as well as you're, they are actually leaving their motorcycle. <laughs> you know, you got to consider where they might land. Can they be left there where they landed? When you think about in this situation, this guy landed on a hot mud car hood. Would you leave him? No. I'm seeing a lot of no's. But what if you were just able to put a blanket up underneath, perhaps that mylar blanket underneath of there? Would that maybe be enough to protect them from the it? Guard smoke depends on it. Yeah, if the, right. So, you, yeah, this is one of those situations. You've got to consider all the other options that are going on. Is the car smoking? Is there a fire underneath that hood? Obviously, if there is fire underneath the hood, yes, you're going to need to get them off of there right away, right? So we, we need to consider what's going on. If maybe they just created a dent in the hood and you don't see any smoke, do you think it might be okay to leave them there then? It could be. You, know, you just gotta consider all those types of things on whether you wanna leave that person there. Then you would go to using perhaps one of those techniques that we just discussed earlier in the previous section of how to move them, right? Could you, could you see how maybe a log roll might be helpful to help roll them to the edge of the hood and then be able to get them off the hood working together. Would that be a technique you might use? Yeah, could be. All right. All right, so now we've talked about the legs, then up above. Obviously, the heart and lungs is protected by what? The rib cage, right? So. The first thing that's going to hit is going to be the rib cage, and then the heart and lungs is going to come up into the rib cage. 
looks like this. When someone's coming up, sees that they're, they're going to have a crash, what's their tech, their tendency to respond with? Hold their breath. Hold their breath. Maybe hold their breath. Maybe say something like, "Oh shit." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So then they're expelled. You know, if they're they're speaking though, instead of just holding their breath, they're also then reducing some of the, the capacity of their lungs at the same time. So, you know, but as they hit, the rib cage is going to hit, your heart and lungs is going to hit on the rib cage, and then your back spine will probably provide additional compression on there. So this is where we could end up seeing maybe a puncture in the lung or something like that. Might be something we might have to consider. By, by the broken ribs, that can cause the punctures to the lung. Collapse of the lung. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then the heart gets squeezed by that spinal column, pressing up against your heart. So it gets squeezed between, inside the rib cage. Obviously in this case, you know, we're seeing a steering wheel here, but that still can apply for a motorcyclist. You could hit on that front fairing if you've got a full dresser motorcycle. And then the heart obviously is used to transport blood in and out of the heart. So you could possibly you know, tear an aorta or, or an aortic tear. That's something that we're not all trained to do, though, is to be able to address those situations. It could be a life-threatening bleed that we're not able to address as a bystander. So I don't want you to beat up on yourself that you're not able to address every single thing that, that has happened to that person. Also, our belly area is not protected. Some of us have a well-endowed belly. Yeah. Um, but then there's lots of things inside there that are also moving around too. And those could get jarred out of place as well. And to each one of your organs, there's usually some type of vessels that are bleeding bringing blood to them and then back to the heart. So it, you know, everything is nice and neatly inside your body and then it's all getting jarred. That's why we consider that there is some type of trauma going to occur with an accident. You know, everything is being jarred out of place. It may cause tears to your blood vessels. An angular injury. What, what <coughs> Where would you see probably most of the injuries here? Shoulder. Shoulders. The ribs, hips. Ribs, legs. hips, yep. Okay. Now somebody with a broken hip, you leave them in that position? Or you try to straighten them or what, what's the call on that? I, is it still going to be coming back to, you know, what is the situation? You know, you're trying to address it. I mean, are, do, first, you've got to consider, are they in immediate danger, right? So yeah. even if they have a hip, a hip injury or something, you know, so if they're in the middle of the street like this, you're going to want to move them, right? Huh? If they're in the middle of the street like this, you want to get them out. Yeah, you may traffic. need to get them out of, out of the middle of the road, right? <coughs> so that's, that's a risky situation to be in, unless you're able to protect that scene well enough that nobody's going to come inside that scene. Yeah, I have a, I have this a, South Cobb Drive is a, <laughs> is obviously a bad traffic area. Yeah, I know. I, I know a friend of mine. Uh, this is an example. He was riding home from work. He worked at Delta. He hit a he hit a deer on South Fulton. So he was laying there he was by himself, and while well, he's there, he was. I guess he was around a corner because a car came and hit him while he was laying there. After he hit the deer, he was down. The bike was down. Laying out there, and I guess somebody couldn't see him at night because then the Honda City right. came and ran him over. Nobody was around. Yeah, nobody was there to, to start protecting the scene, right? Yeah. So, so that, you know, there, there's a chance of something happening like that. I mean, obviously, if you're by yourself, there's no one else to look out for you. Right. Okay, that, so, that, would, that would be the situation. There. So, it's amazingly, he did survive on them. Okay. So, like we said, you know, we're talking about side impact. 
You could have ribs broken. You could have hip, uh, legs, femur. You know, lots of different things that could be broken down on that side. Obviously, when it's an angular hit. Laying the bike down. That's a drag still there. Yeah. So, you know, we're going to look at those types of situations as well. Laying the bike down. We're probably looking at very similar type injuries that than an angular type of injury. A well. girl in the back's not wearing any protection, so she's going to have a heck of a road rash and skin and all kinds she of will. stuff. Yeah, a little bit of that. Wow. Um, it is probably helpful for you to wear protective gear, right? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> or, or know how to wear your gear properly. And then also consider what you're wearing. <laughs> oh, Just for my dirt bike ride. <laughs> okay. um, and I thought, you know, considering that, you know, when you lay the bike down, you're going to end up on that side, right? So there's all kinds of things that might happen. Either a fractured collarbone. About how much pounds of pressure would it take to break a collarbone? Eight. Eight. A little bit more than that. Twenty-five pounds of pressure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Doesn't, that doesn't take a lot, right? Just the uh, just you know, 150 pound human landing on the ground would probably end up doing. When we go back and talk about the protective gear, what type of gear would be the most, provide you the most protection? For, for, for your collarbone? Or, or for anything. I mean, you know, if, if you're, you know, if we go back to laying the bike down and talk about, you yeah. know, what, what she's wearing, obviously she's not wearing a lot there. Oh my gosh. Um, you know, if you end up coming off the bike and on, during the laying the bike down, how far would you, could you slide, say, in a pair of jeans before they would actually tear? About 10 feet, maybe? Maybe, maybe about 10 feet, 8 to 12 feet, you would say, yeah. Uh, but then you could get Kevlar, right? It's the next level up. Would that provide you maybe twice as much? Which is better, uh, leather or Kevlar? Leather would give you up to about probably 80 feet. Oh. Yeah. Not that we all want to ride with leather, right? She obviously didn't think that leather was appropriate. Well, because it's too hot. <laughs> too hot in the summertime. Also, by the help, help, she has no elbow pads. Yeah. She has no gloves. So, yes, she okay. But, you know, let's consider also, you know, you, if someone has gone down and you're coming into the scene, take a look at what they're wearing. You know, then you might have to check on certain things to see if maybe that, that type of material has tore all the way through when they actually went down. You know, you might not have to worry about it as much then at that point, or that might, when you get, finally get into treatment, you may actually need to search underneath that type of material to see if there's anything that did get injured. So when you come up with, to the scene, also, remember the video I showed you earlier, though, they talked about that one of the boys was making noise but the wife wasn't making any noise. So who was actually in better condition at that point? The boy who was making noise, right? But if they're not making any noise, they probably are in worse shape and need to be addressed more sooner. Now in that situation, would you move him out of the road? Um, I don't know what's on down the road at that point, but if I could protect that scene where he is right there, I'd probably leave him right there. Well, normally if he's conscious, he's going to move out of the road. I guess the only time you would actually move him if he's unconscious? No. No, I mean, it wouldn't be, depend on the consciousness. It would be whether he's going to be in immediate danger for where he is. If he's, he's away from the motorcycle at this point. And if I'm able to send somebody down the road and block the scene, then I should be able to keep that safe. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, the situation is always fluid. It's always fluid, yes. All right, ejection. Yeah, Obviously, we, a lot of that would happen in motorcycle racing.
So an in injection, what may be, what would be your leading part in Army? What part of you would probably be leading if you're ejected from your rotors? Head, your hands, probably your head, rest. right? So we need to consider about possible head injuries, probably more likely in this type of situation. So the leading cause of death usually is because of some type of head injury. And you know, we're not, it's not just your skull. I mean, you've got a helmet on, perhaps the helmet is hit, the skull is, is moving around inside the helmet, and then, but then there's still the brain and parts that are connected to the brain that are moving around. Can I ask you a question about helmets while, while we're on the subject? Okay. What is the maximum force by law that they're designed for? It, there there um, must be a minimum standard of how much impact well, I mean, a helmet I, can I, take. I, I don't know what the forces are. It's just that there's a DOT spec. That's what I was asking about. There must be a minimum spec. Yeah, of I don't know what the number is. I just know that allowed. in order to something I don't talk about. That's well, why I wonder if we can discuss that. DOT certification has certain minimums that it needs to reach. I don't know what those specs are. I was just curious as to what that standard actually is. I, yeah, I don't. Yeah, it would. It may vary by manufacturer or DOT. Or how much a helmet can take. Also. While well, we're on the subject, also is this the size of the helmet? What is it? How does that affect you in a crash? If your helmet's too large, would that affect you versus a helmet that's properly sized? Would you be sustained more injury I, 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 on a looser helmet? I wouldn't know. I, I can answer that. The shell of the helmet doesn't change; it's the internal that's different. A medium-sized helmet, a large helmet, are circumferentially the same size. It's the cushioning that's with inside the helmet that makes the difference. Right. You want to make sure that the helmet does not move when you go side to side because if I hit my helmet turns, it could break my neck. Right. So I want to make sure that my cheeks are squeezed and that it's set in. But physically, the helmet is the same size. And in terms of the helmet being DOT regulated, it's funny as you're saying that I just got a new helmet that is class uh, class two Snell rated which is a better regulation for race bikes and so forth than the DOT. That is what I want to bring up. Yeah, they're completely two different things I want, but th those those helmets that are safer are not street legal, but they don't hold to the standards of the DOT. Are they tighter than the normal street? They're, they're, they're tighter, they have a better uh, better protection against concussions and head injuries because you're more likely going to crash on the yeah. track and on the road. I mean, I, I know that, the, you know, it, obviously when a manufacturer makes a certain model helmet, there's usually a couple different sizes that the outside shell is, but then they vary that by by how much padding they put inside the helmet. Yeah, that's what I wanted, but, that's what I wanted to bring but, up. But I don't know what there's the, too many variables. But but the but the numbers that in order to meet those certifications, I'm we don't address those or, or have those numbers here. Yeah, I was just curious about that. No. Also, also. Uh, the guys in the store always says, well, if your helmet's more than eight years old, you need to replace it. Is that a true statement, or is that just something they're throwing out there to sell you a new helmet? Uh, I, w I would recommend replacement. I mean, I teach the same thing in my riding academy classes. If it gets to a certain age, yes, you should, because considering, you know, you have, there, there's, everyone uses their helmets differently or, or different frequency. Well, you also I'm, different a, I'm a rider who wears it every week. Uh, yeah. Are you wearing modular, or do you wear what? I'm wearing modular helmets partially as an example to my new students. All right, versus, say, say the half helmets, like a lot of your Harley guys like to wear the half helmets because they're more comfortable. But how, how much actual protection are you getting from those versus, say, full face? You know, it, it's, I mean, the, the difference is night and day between a full face and a, and a half. But, I mean, that's a personal choice you take and the liability you take. Um, I wear a half helmet. And I enjoy mine, but we do have riders that has full face helmets, and they they enjoy theirs. Yeah, well, for instance, I, I wear full face because I've had too much in my face, you know. Um, because at one time when I first started riding back in the seventies, helmets were not required, so I started riding long ways with no helmet. But and believe I, me, I have swallowed bugs and grasshoppers right. and all kinds of fun. But stuff. I can I can tell you from from experience, that you can take a skull cap, which you can buy at the local flea market or or Walmart's or somewhere or another that's not DLT legal, take an eight pound sledgehammer and it will crack in half with the first hit. Exactly, that's fine. You can take a DLT helmet and it will take at least five to six hits the same power. Really? So it's really it's, it's the cushioning inside also because you're out of shell. Yeah, it's, it's cushioning, design, specs. I mean, every every helmet is going to be different. Mm -hmm. But 
you know, it, but it's also rider choice. And we, we don't push you to go one way or the other in this class um, on, on helmet designs and, and what you should, should use. I know what my personal preferences are. It's different from his personal preferences, different from everyone else's personal preferences. Just, you know, perhaps a regulated helmet would be one that I, we would like to see everybody riding in. So uh, I guess my point, my overall point is, say you get ejected from a bike, you know, can you, is it better to try to roll over, hit on your back versus taking like a sudden impact with your head? Um, we're, we're addressing, the, per the person has had the accident. That's what we're trying to address, right. not how you should eject yourself from a motorcycle. True. I wish we all had a choice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not everybody would have it. Yeah. <laughs> how you eject. Right. I mean, you can eject gracefully. Some, you can something eject showed up in front of you. I don't think you're going to have much choice at how you're going to get ejected. You can do it gracefully. You can just go like. Right. Okay. But we are, so we're, we're addressing what to do at the, the accident. Not as as how you should act, have your accident. <laughs> yeah, because he said he, he's been seen an accident where a guy hit his head and the helmet cracked. Right. Yeah. So it did take the effect. Okay. All right. So so head injury. I mean, the, the leading cause. Let's get back to to the subject here. The leading cause is usually brain injury. Um, you know, and also not only brain injury, but your your the gray matter inside your head is attached to the rest of your organs and your your uh, circulation system and there there could be different things that that happen inside that you know obviously as a bystander we're not going to be able to address those things I mean we're not here as head surgeons to, to address those situations uh, but obviously you know if you see that there's been an impact on the outside of the helmet a scratch or a crack or something like that then you can assume that there probably is some type of head injury and you need to be very careful with that person. Try to maintain that, that mobilization and not move them if you don't have to, you know, to help reduce those things. And then point, when EMS arrives on the scene, point these things out to them. You've been there ass assessing the situation, assessing that something has happened, and you notice that I was riding with John, you know, as we went out on this ride, he had a very nice clean helmet and now I see he's got scratches and scratches across his visor and a crack in there that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid he may have taken some type of hit on his head. That would be your part as a bystander to, to EMS to help them identify what things may have happened. Because they don't know, they weren't riding with him beforehand and saw that he had a nice clean helmet before that accident. Now the motorcycle can itself be a mechanism of injury, and we want to consider that the different styles of motorcycles that we ride, how they're customized, might attribute to those injuries. Okay. So let's take a look at the various types of motorcycles. You'll have your basic standard motorcycle with just a set of handlebars, but then the next picture here, that person customized it by adding an add-on windshield, right? Um, we've got some handlebars that are down low, you know, on sport bikes. We've got touring bikes with bearings and windshields on top of them. And then obviously we've got our heavily customized motorcycles with 23-inch wheels and over-the-shoulder apes, right? <laughs> I saw a guy like that. Yeah, I, I wanted to see this guy in my my skilled rider class. Actually, seeing him do the, the turn in the box. <laughs> is that a real picture? Or is that just something made up? It's a real picture. Like, the guy that actually tried it. Wow. You rise it obviously that way. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> uh, but now let's consider. I mean, look at this motorcycle. Where do you, if, if all of a sudden this motorcycle was in an accident? What type of things might we have to watch for that may have caused injury to this person? His face, face is going to go in the tank. Yeah. In the tank or else somewhere between the two handlebars, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, you see those long tailpipes off the back end? They're probably not going to stand up there if it was a sudden impact. He'd have, he'd have They're probably actually probably going to lean forward into his back. 
Yeah, I think his collarbone would let go pretty quick. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's take a look, look at the next one. Fairly typical sport bike. But look at the position of where the rider rides and where the passenger rides. Passenger is sitting up there a lot higher than the, the rider is, right? Mm -hmm. So when that, if that motorcycle took a front hit, perhaps that rider who's sitting up high on the back, maybe the first one ejected off the motorcycle. How about this one? The face of injury on the handlebar. Might have to turn the light off for this one, Ed. Yeah, I see that. Something spiky somewhere. Oh, yeah, that, that's not a paint job. <laughs> that's not a paint job. <laughs> oh. All right, so well, you I come see. to a sudden stop. Oh, yeah. And you slide off the seat. Ooh. Ooh. Oh. That is peeled back metal, guys and gals. <laughs> okay? What was that guy thinking? <laughs> Again, the passenger is sitting up high behind the rider. It doesn't seem like there's much in the front of the motorcycle to stop the rider from going in that direction. How about this one? I'll get that one. Here, I'll give you another picture of it. Yeah, there you go. This is my German Shepherd King. He rides in a sidecar. And, and we've had that discussion several times. If I had an accident, what might King's reaction be? Oh, that's deal? you. That is me. Oh, okay. That is me and my German Shepherd. Does, he, does King have any restraint whatsoever? He just has one leash hanging off the handle here on the side card tied to his soft collar. Oh, my God. That was I got a soft on collar him. on him, and I got a choker on him, but I only t fastened the soft collar. If he ever got ejected, it would be all over for him. Yeah, but actually he rode since the since he was five months old, and before then he was riding down in the nose of the sidecar. That's cool. I'm sure he likes that. <laughs> yeah. But we don't, you know, we don't, I mean, he enjoys riding with us, but we don't know, I mean, if something happened serious to us, what was his, his reaction to be? That would give somebody else something that more to deal with. Okay, thank you, now on your sidecar, do you have difficulty steering in one direction or the other? I mean, the it's steering's different. not it's the same both directions. It's not right? the same in both directions, no. But a 125-pound German Shepherd helped it out. Oh, <laughs> really, 125 pounds? That's big. 125-pound German Shepherd. Yeah. Oh. That's cool. Do you have a break? Of being uh, paralyzed or the even death with that type of an accident. 
but uh, I'm here today to tell about this from the good care I received uh, in the hospital, especially at the scene. While we're not expecting to encounter anything like what happened to Bob, we must nonetheless be prepared for such misfortune. We all know, for example, that whenever a motorcycle crash does occur, we, because we often travel in groups like this, are most likely to be first on the scene. We also know that just as we take every possible safety precaution to prevent trouble, we must be... 99. <laughs> I marked that car. I was like, that's 99. No, it's 2005. <laughs> about the video I mean it's kind of was it the, how a situation would actually come to, to fruition I mean yeah we have a, a motorcyclist who had an accident and then we would be making contact to EMS so the next section we're going to talk about is how to make contact to EMS uh, in this in this segment here. just out of curiosity they can now triangulate cell phones right yeah okay. yeah and then and, that, and that's been a lot of changes that have been made as we go down down uh, in, I mean, well, with enhanced 911, yeah, they're able to actually get a lot closer on, on your location. So, when we want, when do we want to call 911? Actually, during our initial assessment, if a cell phone is available. So, if we can get somebody and get a signal, we want to assess the situation quickly using those things we talked about in the previous segment of us of how we would assess. Uh, and if you had to leave the scene to call for help. Now then, you know, that's going to feed back then, you know, you've got your person, all right, so how do we want to leave that person? Probably in a recovery position if it's possible, so they don't regurgitate back on something else. Uh, send lovely Lisa, not scary Harry. You know, if we're out in the farm country or something like that, you think some, one of these ladies would be easier, able to get that door open than a big burly biker? Yeah. So we want to send somebody who, who's going to be able to, to actually get some help. And if you need to send somebody to call, make sure you ask them to return back to the scene to let you know that they made that call. All right? Because otherwise you might be sitting there and waiting. You know, I think AMS is on the way. I think AMS is on the way. But you don't know that unless they make that call and actually tell you that they have. Okay. So dispatch. In Georgia, we have just your regular 911. And in fact, some counties in, in Georgia, we have like three counties are covered by the same 911 system down in South Georgia. So you might make that call, and then they need to know a little bit more information, like which county you're calling from. In Heinz 91, to be able to determine your address you're calling from, if it's a landline. And now, a lot of days, with most cell phones have a GPS system, the Enhanced 911 is then able to pick up on your cell phone's location and actually pinpoint a lot closer to where you are. Yeah. Um, cell phone signals, though, might be received far away, so you might have to give them your cell phone number in case you lose the call. Uh, but a lot of people are, you know, the only phone number that they have is a cell number now. And then there are other web applications and things like that that are available now to make the contact to EMS. Uh, and nowadays we can probably text the 911 since that might go through where you might not get a cell signal. You might be able to at least get that data, data signal. All right. When you reach 911, don't hang them up on them until they tell you that they've got all the information they need. They're going to want to know what happened. They're going to want to know how many vehicles, how many are injured, possible injuries. They would like your name and then also your location, where you're calling from and where the accident may have occurred. So you might have to provide them more than one location uh, when they get that information. Yeah, and you could give them locations maybe by providing them some details about the street names or even the signs that you've passed. 
you know, exit numbers, identifiable landmarks, and perhaps even you're out of the co country, they might know where that uh, crossroad is that you might just call it by some country crossroad or something like that. Give them an idea of where you were coming from and headed to and give them a general direction so they can try to find you. EMS is trying to get on the scene, get that person packaged up within the golden hour. So, you know, severe trauma, they need to be transported as quickly as possible and to be transported to a, a trauma patient to surgery, they're trying to do it within the hour. So don't delay on calling them. And the EMS's goal is when they get there, they're going to try to package them up, have them in the ambulance and out of there by in 10 minutes. And by the way, if you put the gloves on, when you're in there in the scene, they'll, they'll kind of get an idea. Oh, this person knows something about protecting themselves or maybe how to help us out at the scene of the accident and then they'll ask you to help them out a little bit more on uh, that information. Phil, I'm going to go ahead before okay. we move on with that one. Um, so so uh, Ed says he's done a little bit of research and he wants to share that information with us. Yeah, so, and this might help you all too, especially when you're on the beaten path. Uh, last time we did this course, they were talking about an because I, I used to live up in Dahlonega and such as in Cleveland, Georgia, where there's lack thereof of a cell phone service or a cell phone signal. So what do you do? And um, I'll look more into it. And there are alternatives to, especially in the day and age where we are right now, you've got to think there's got to be something like OnStar for a bike, right? Um, and, and in fact, there is. There, um, one app, which uh, it, unfortunately does sell uh, reviews and people I've talked to that have the app, it's called Biker SOS. It's an app, it's free, and it will notify if, the, if your cell phone drops while you're riding, it will notify the emergency services that you have gone down, and it'll sell your GPS signal out immediately to your location. All right, so Biker SOS is one, it is a free app. The other one is OnStar. If you have an OnStar subscription with any General Motors vehicle after t uh, 2008, um, they, uh, they will have it on your cell phone, and you can dispatch them or have them on your phone as well. Um, and last but not least, any vehicle, majority from any manufacturer from 2015 on, uh, has a form of SOS or a uh, emergency service vehicle button. So if you have people dispatched to, if you're riding in a group to go to the head of the group or the rear of the group, when you flag down a vehicle, ask them immediately, do you have emergency services in your vehicle? Do you have an SOS button that we can locate? The, it's not. It, it, it part, and it's all about the golden hour, and that's why I wanted to wait for here. If it can stop, if it can go ahead and bring down response time by another 20 minutes, because we're up on the twisties on Blood Mountain, it's going to be 25, 30 minutes before EMS gets there. Or if you're on a pathway, you know, it can be another 30 minutes, even an hour, depending on your location, right? Especially if you went off the side of the mountain. Those are very, very critical seconds we're dealing with. So this is just the tools that are free and the ideas that are free that can help save someone's life, especially when it can speed it up potentially up by 30 minutes, okay? So Biker SOS, OnStar if you don't have it, and remember, any vehicle after 2015 should have some sort of emergency vehicle service button inside of it. Okay. Thanks, Bill. All right, thank you. Thank you. Yep. I also think yeah. uh, Apple Watch has a has some kind of feature where if you go down, it will notify everybody where you're at. And, and right, and, like and, but I think about in your situation where in iTrail Ride 2, where if I'm taking a jump or something and it jolts it, it might be sending a lot of false signals. So it's yeah. like the cry wolf yeah. symbol. So I would rather, out of all of them, I like the OnStar because it does do the same thing, but it'll at least ask me to some extent. If I don't respond within 30 seconds, it'll dispatch immediately. Or I have a button where I can hit, and it will it will go off. I mean, cell phones are eventually going to be global phones. In other words, they'll be satellite, so we don't have to deal with all this crap in the end of the next five years. But until that point, these are the tools that we have. Yeah. I know one thing that, um, at least with with my in-laws, mm -hmm. we've started sharing our locations more often too, yeah. um, using you know, like Google Maps or something like that, it will turn on the, the, the location sharing or something like that. At least, you know, I had my brother-in-law riding to, to my house from Virginia. I had some idea where he was, at least probably within 10 minutes or something like that. So it might be helpful at least, you know, 
you know, all of a sudden you get the, the emergency call from them or something like that, at least you got some idea of where they were um, within a certain amount of time because they can send somebody to them. I think that would be possible. Something that we do for our group, you know, again, we're, we're, we asked all of our members to carry, we, we have a little red card, and it's not for necessary for EMS, but we ask them to put it in their wallet, and it's the next contact. Emergency contact. Emergency contact. Now, for like me and her, she cannot be on my mercy contact because she may be on the bike with us. But we, so we list our daughter on there. And that way, if we go down or something, a fellow rider can get that card and call our daughter and say, hey, they're headed to this hospital. Go here now. Mm -hmm. We uh, had someone to actually in our group that actually ordered the cards for everyone to have. Oh, okay. And it just says emergency contact. It's red. Put it with your license because the first thing the EMS is going to do is pull your license. They're going to see that. Yeah. And there are other ways that you can get that information provided to EMS as well. If you've got uh, a road ID or something like that, at least then they have a, a site that they go to and they can put in your ID number and then actually pull up your medical history. Um, obviously, on the cell phones, a lot of the ICE numbers and things like that, you know, I realized I had to change a whole bunch of mine this year. Um, and then, you know, there's implied consent too. I mean, if you're wearing one of these IDs, you know, that it's okay for you to go ahead and help me. You know, and these are things that you might want to watch out for or to address as well. I mean, they could be pretty for some of the ladies or something like that. <laughs> you know. um, but, you know, those are the types of things. Cell phones, obviously, um, you know, of course, a lot of us lock the phones. You know, if you get a credit card secured in your, your, your phone, then it's going to probably lock up in any way. I know some of the well, like my lock screen is my ICE. Okay. So nice. you just touch my cell phone and it's right there. Everything you so, need to know. Yeah. All right. That's cool. That's good. Yeah. Um, I know of you know being with the rider coach community. I know of some riders that they've got their jacket. They got a little zipper pocket here on their sleeve, and then they put a little red cross on there. Inside, they've actually put all their information on the USB drive. So then, they, you know, EMS can slip that into their laptop or something like that and actually be able to look at that information, too. So there's all kinds of different ways that you could actually help by providing that information, especially if, you know, you may be unconscious. They can't go ask you all of these basic questions and try to get information from you, right? Because so the next thing that you'd be wanting to do is trying to gather information. So if they're a conscious person, you need to request permission from them to, to help them, all right? If they're unconscious, you, you have an implied cons consent. But ask them for their real name, not their rider name. Yeah, we, we kid our, our new riders in the class that are under the age of 21, we call them verticals. We actually had one who put them as their road name, vertical. That's because their license is in portrait form instead of landscape form. <laughs> That's why we call them verticals. Uh, but, you know, trying to find out what, what actually is hurting, or if they're allergic to anything, and maybe it's just a bee sting. I'm allergic to bee stings. Uh, you know, but also, if they got any allergies, it might be important to let, you know, if they know they got a, a medication allergy, to have that information handy, though, so that they don't possibly get it. Uh, that type of medication, or, or if they're on any medications, and their past medical history, last food or drink, could be important, to, you know, depending on how soon they had ate something, uh, whether they're going to be able to, to help them out with, you know, that, you know, normally they're not want any food or drink to interfere with a medical assistance. And then the events of what happened. So this is the type of information you want to try to gather from them, if you can. All right, life-threatening injuries. So I got another little video to show you. Yeah. 
the mic with it. You're in a hurry. Oh. Hi, Mr. Davis. You'll be seeing Dr. White today. <laughs> no, <laughs> funny. I get the feeling I've seen you somewhere before. You'd be surprised who rides a motorcycle. Show the people on two wheels the same courtesy and respect you deserve. A message from the AMA. <laughs> life-threatening injuries. So we use one acronym is the ABCs. You know, so we want to think about the airway, breathing, circulation, spinal injury, and also shock. And when we talk about the ABCs. So I'll just uh, bring that up here, actually. There we go. Priorities are our three. Airway. If they're not breathing, then how are they going to be able to continue to be with us? And they're breathing. You know, if it's impeded in some way, we may need to address that. Circulation, the bleeding, the treat for shock, and then also our spinal motion restriction. All right. So, like I said, we want to also make sure that they're they're not going to be able to sustain any additional spinal injury. So, when we're looking at someone, we want to try to do a rapid assessment. Like we said, we want to try to help out EMS, help them get to being able to be taken care of if they had to go to surgery within an hour. But also, we want to look at the box of life. That would be anything that happened within the head, the neck, the chest, and the abdomen and area. So one way of doing that is a head-to-toe assessment. And we did get a lot more into that when we do our advanced class as well, but you want to look Look over everything, you know, the person's laying there, try to assess parts of their body, see if you see any abnormal bleeding that shouldn't be there, if there's any bones sticking out. Um, in order to be able to check their back, if you have additional assistance, you could then actually roll them on their side and roll them back using the log roll technique that we talked about earlier, or even by yourself, if you roll them into a recovery position, you could then assess that back as well. Airway. So we need a spinal injury that should be you know, suspected in all motorcycle crashes. Because obviously we don't have a car cage around us to help protect us. We're going to, the first thing that's going to end up taking the hit is going to be the motorcyclist. Uh, in some way. And, you know, if we're going to issue rescue breathing to them, we don't do the same technique that we do in CPR. Because if we're concerned about spinal injury, we don't want to be doing a head tilt chin lift technique. So what we do in, in this case is we'll do a jaw thrust technique, which will be the preferred method for the trauma because it uses the hinge jaw. If you take your thumb Put them on the sides of your jaw, right behind your jawbone, and then try to push forward on that. Now you can feel then how that could open up your lower jaw, pushing forward. Obviously, since we're all conscious, at least I think we are, <laughs> you're only going to push so far, right? <laughs> uh, but it helps get the tongue you know, lift the tongue off the back of the throat, creating a passage for air to go down through. The head tilt chin lift in, in CPR, they open it up that way. And, but we don't want to do that next. Uh, so is this done without the helmet on then? Um, actually, yeah, we would end up having to do this after we do a helmet removal. Because, mm -hmm. well, just like with your helmet, if you consider, if you had your helmet on, no one's going to be able to take their fingers and actually get back here behind your jaw to push it forward. Mm -hmm. So we do this technique when we're assessing that they're not breathing. And only if they're not breathing, then we have to do a helmet removal first and then do a jaw thrust technique to get the air in. 
So if we assess that they are breathing with the helmet on, perhaps leave, would be normally leave the helmet on. It could be as simple as loosening that chin strap and then maybe they might start breathing too. So as we go through a helmet removal, we want to consider actually removing, uh, loosening up that airway just so we can actually see if they'll start breathing. All right, so in airway, same thing that you would do in CPR. You want to look, see if the chest is rising or falling and listen for breathing Feel for the air coming through the nose or mouth as the, as the chest rises or falls, all right? And then if the, the breathing is, if no breathing is detect, detected, then we're going to need to, to uh, lift the jaw. And if they're still not breathing on their own, then we need to give them rescue breath. All question? Yep. So, how do you give them reg rescue breaths, yet you're going to have to let go of the jaw, their tongue's going to go back in, are you going to have to do the head tilt? No, you, you'll still keep keep the jaw thrusting forward. And we'll get into, the, we're going to get into this on, on, okay. as we go through, obviously, rescue breathing and helmet removal is what we're getting into right now, on how to address the airway and get them breathing. All right, so our best position, obviously we're here, we got the, the person is, is inclined on, on the ground and we're listening, opening up the visor, trying to feel if there's any kind of breathing going on, assessing if there's any kind of, uh, if the chest is rising or falling. After the helmet has been removed, we're going to use the thumb to hold the head down. So you're actually going to be pressing on, on the cheek and then using your fingers actually behind that jaw to push forward on. You'll feel you'll see that slight jutting on the jaw and we'll watch for the breathing. So how does that jaw work? Well, you know, it, the jaw has a two-purpose two joint. Obviously, we use it this way mostly, right? Opening and closing our mouth, talking, eating, crunching food, right? Our normal operation. But with the tongue attached to the jaw, we can actually slide it forward and back, pressing on the jaw. And it lifts the tongue as it, as that's also attached to that the jaw. It's more attached to the bottom part of the jaw. All right. So when we talk about breathing, you have about five minutes to get air in before the brain, the brain starts has damage due to lack of oxygen. It's important for us to make a good seal. And what we want to do at first is give two breaths initially then give one breath every 60 seconds. So this is when you're actually having to do the breaths themselves. All right. Each breath should last about a second. And then gauge the air you give to the size of the person and don't blow too forcefully. And always, if you can, use a barrier. All right. We have different types of barriers. So on the jaw thrust technique, and we're going to do something similar to this. Uh, we have a mannequin and we've got uh, valves and, and uh, seals to put on, the, on there to actually do the breath. We're going to actually do jaw thrust rescue breathing. So let me just repeat again. Let's not do the head tilt chin lift. It's just going to be a jaw thrust. barriers. They're always a good idea to have. Here we go. Here we go. 
that's of various types we can just pass around, take a look at. A couple of these types here are really good for those with, with air or something. These can be blown up and actually feed fit on top. When we do practicing here in a little bit, we're going to use something similar to this one. It's got like a one-way valve in here so that it, anything that comes back out stops and doesn't come towards you. Another type is what we call a MIDI, and this is what the type I have uh, several of those back there in the back available for sale. Uh, they don't take up a lot of space, uh, so they would be easy to add to your motorcycle trauma kit. But the design of these is it has what we call a MIDI portion that you could actually insert into the mouth to help keep the mouth open and then it also has built in the one-way valve and a plastic shield to put between you and them. I have a question about the one-way valve. Can the victim actually breathe out through the one-way valve or does it stop? It, it, it probably will. It, well, there's a filter in there that actually stops it from coming all the way out to you. I mean, so they probably can breathe out, but it's going to stop any contaminants. Okay, because yeah, that, that would be, you know, I mean, the victim obviously has to breathe. Yeah, I mean, once they start breathing, you're going to remove any barrier you're using to allow them to be able to breathe then. All right, because you're only doing this long enough for them to start breathing on their own. So you're not going to, you know, once they start breathing, you want to remove those barriers out of the way. Actually, that's cool. Yeah. And those, those inserts come in different lengths on these mini versions. Uh, there's also some types that don't even have a lot of gap between them that you can use to rescue with. Uh, some that are a little bit smaller. So there's all types of, of barriers that are on the market that are available for use. And here would be an example of using a flat type barrier. It's just going across their, their mouth and their nose, because you're going to need to close off the nose as well. And then you have at least some type of small valve or entry that you could actually push your air through. So very similar to the, the mini type as well. reasons you can dis discontinue rescue breathing, obviously. The person starts breathing on their own. So at that point, remove that barrier and let them try to breathe on their own. I mean, it, you know. Or someone who arrives who knows the jaw thrust technique, rescue breathing, and can take over. Or you become too exhausted to continue. Don't feel bad that you may have become too exhausted to continue. I mean, it it's, actually will be more valuable to the person or family members that you at least try to do what you could. Okay, so so if, even if you got exhausted, I mean, you could have been there doing it for 20, 30 minutes or something like that. That's more than, you know, the, the amount of time that hopefully you'll never have to go to that extreme, but, you know, that someone can actually, you know, that you will be able to do it and hopefully be successful but at least you were able to try as someone who's had that type of training to assist them.
full face helmets. Now obviously we come with, you know, we were start talking a little bit earlier about different types of helmets. Obviously I, you know, we full, we're, we're going to we're gonna practice is using a full face helmet removal. But if you had a modular helmet, treat it as if it's a full face helmet because that chin guard may not be able to operate anymore. And you should still be able to remove that helmet as if you're doing, removing a full face helmet. Obviously, they're out there on the market is also three quarter helmets and half helmets. In either case, any of the helmets, if you're going to end up doing rescue breathing, you'll probably end up removing the helmet anyway, no matter what type of helmet it is, because it's going to be difficult for you to be able to get your fingers in and do that jaw thrust. On a three-quarter helmet, you've got cheek pads here on the side that are going to stop you from doing that. And on the half helmet, just removing that chin strap, that helmet's going to fall off anyway. So you might as well get the helmet out of the way. But we're going to practice it as if it's a full-face helmet. I'm glad to see some of you have brought helmets so we can go through and do, do it that way. And I've got a few helmets with me that uh, have been sanitized, so if you want to practice it, then you know, at least one person can grab a helmet and practice, be practiced with. Okay? So how do we do a helmet removal? Well, first you need to make sure that the person knows how to put their helmet on properly. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all got that one right. <laughs> Pretty good. So in order for a helmet to be removed, two conditions must be process, present. A full face helmet or, or that the helmet interferes with your ability to control the airway. All right, so obviously any other type of helmet, it would be the same thing. It would be obviously interfering with your ability to be able to control that airway. You can't get your fingers in there and open up that airway. All right, and according to the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, a two-person rescuer is needed for removal. So we'll, we'll go through and explain how that's done. Sometimes it's just better to take them off. Okay, so using two rescuers, we would assess the breathing so you got rescuer one is in white, rescuer two is in yellow. So we'll assess the breathing for rescuer one. They'll check to see if they're breathing. And also they'll actually be holding the head at that point. Assess, remove the chin strap, and then they'll roll, try to put the head into a, no, a neutral position. Neutral position, we're talking about that the nose is in alignment with the rest of the body, all right? If, if you find that person and their head is turned one way and you try to bring it into the neutral position and won't go any farther, do not force it. Just go work with it from that position. And the fourth one is we'll have place one hand at the base of the skull. They're actually up here underneath the skull and the other one is over the chin. So this person now is going to be taking over control of the head. And then the lead person then is going to be pulling the helmet straight back while pulling on the sides, being careful of the nose. And then six, the hand will stop along the base of the helmet, along the base of the head as it moves along with the helmet. Once the helmet's off, then that person's going to place their hands back across on the sides of the head. My part of this is kind of explain some things about insurance and just this kind of is passed along from my experience um, both with representing friends and other folks that have been you know really hurt in, in accidents uh, and this particular story relates to a friend of mine Brian um, Brian his wife my wife and I were friends and about 10 years ago uh, he had a really rough situation that happened to him and if he had had a little bit more knowledge ahead of time he would have been able to uh, prepare himself a lot better but he was on the way, his way to work at Delta one Sunday morning, and he thought the traffic was clear. He thought everything was fine. He was in the left-hand lane, and someone hit him from behind, knocked him off the side of the road, 
his car was totaled. Um, he had a, a concussion, a, a broken leg at the scene, had to be uh, taken in an ambulance. And uh, he was at there at the uh, Douglas Well Star Hospital, and his wife Michelle called me, and she said, "Jim Br Brian's been in a terrible accident. You know, can you come up and talk to us and see him?" So I went up to see him, and he was slowly recovering. Um, but the thing Michelle asked me about was insurance, about insurance, because you know the other person was at fault, and she felt some level of assurance that she had full coverage. Her agent said she had full coverage, you know, so that meant they were covered for everything. But that was very misleading because, as you see, once I go through some numbers here, full coverage for Brian and his wife meant really no coverage. So this is where you, it's so important to kind of understand <coughs> what you're buying when you buy insurance because this is the perfect situation where you can really protect yourself um, if you understand how it works, okay? So what do they mean by full coverage? So they had 25,000 in something called liability coverage. Okay, so liability coverage is right. It covers you if you hurt somebody else or injure somebody else in an accident. So they had that, and then they had, uh, they had, tw had 25,000 in something called collision coverage. So collision coverage and comprehensive covers it if your car is wrecked or stolen. All right, so they had that, and then they had 5,000 in MedPay, which 5,000 in MedPay covers you for your medical bills. It just pays that medical bills for anybody who's in the car and you know gets hurt. And then they had 25,000 in uninsured motorists. They call that UM for short. But there's an important distinction to know about uninsured motorists. Do you have offset or add-on? Now, that's about 10 years ago, the legislature in Georgia passed the law that said everybody had to have this option to understand were you buying offset uninsured motorists or add-on? And it's important to know the difference here because the problem for Brian was he had offset. So here's what happened as far as when things kind of got resolved a couple weeks later, Brian found out his hospital bill was 100000 because he had to stay in the hospital for three days. That was the ambulance and hospital bill. And then he had about 30,000 in physical therapy that went on for, for several months after the accident. He lost about three months of work, which was about 15,000. <coughs> and then, so these were his solid medicals. But Really, his case, probably given everything involved, he probably would have gotten another $100,000 in pain and suffering. But what happened to Brian? Well, in this case, he got $25,000 from the at fault, but that was his UM coverage was offset by that $25,000, so that's all he got. And his medical bills alone, with his lost wages, you know, was closer to $200,000. So what happened to Brian and Michelle? They had to file bankruptcy, you know, which was a disaster because you know they, they had been doing pretty well. They were buying a home, and you know everything was going well in their lives, but they didn't they didn't understand this concept because they thought they had full coverage, and that's where I say full coverage in this case meant no coverage. because it didn't, the coverage they were paying for did not help Brian at all in the situation. It just, he had, he had this 25,000 in UM that was offset by the other driver's insurance. So the key in all this, and this is how you can protect yourself, if you buy 
UM coverage, if Brian had bought 250K in UM coverage, he would have been all set because that would have covered his medical bills, his pain and suffering, and he easily could have gotten that out of his UM <coughs> coverage if he had had the add-on coverage. So I hope that, you know, that kind of makes some uh, sense for you with the numbers because the key is kind of looking at your policy and seeing what you got. Because the tendency is that your insurance agent wants to sell you coverage where they don't really have to pay out much on a claim, but they want to call it full coverage. So they say you have all these things and they say you have full coverage, but really they're not paying out. He had Allstate here. His coverage didn't pay out a dime to Brian for any of this that they were paying for, which was really shocking, but that's, you know, that's kind of how insurance works. And, Unless you ask the right questions, you're not going to know about this 50,000 in uninsured motors, or you can even perhaps get more. But that would have been the key to help Brian really save his, his finances. And um, like I said, he would have gotten that in this case. So um, I do free audits for folks that you know have questions about their insurance. It's important to check with your agent to see what you have because. This was a car accident for Brian, but obviously, you know, motorcycle accidents can be much more serious as far as, you know, injuries or, you know, what can happen overall. But this is how you protect yourself. And uh, there's probably as many as uh, 15 to 20 percent of folks out on the roadway who don't have any insurance at all. Right? So in that case, if the person doesn't have any liability coverage, then the, all they have is the UM coverage cover them to protect them so uh, yes sir so so the, the key from this is you have to ask your agent to add on coverage yeah what, ask what, them what how you, much what you add on coverage actually is then. yes sir and then add you know you should, you should consider adding on now it's not that expensive that's a question a lot of folks have how expensive it is it to get this add-on coverage it's really not that expensive you pay, especially if you pay monthly or every six months or however you pay for insurance that add-on feature is so important and you know it really covers you if you're you know in a situation like this so, so the whole key is how much uninsured motorist coverage you have then? right this right here and you want to make sure you have add-on because the offset is not going to do you any good especially if it's only twenty five thousand because it gets offset against the other driver's insurance so that's their route without actually telling you yeah that's i mean because like, like in brian's case the at fault here i think was state farm State Farm paid the twenty-five thousand to Brian, but that was offset by his uh, uninsured motorist, which was Allstate. So Allstate didn't pay anything. Right. Now twenty-five thousand really was not much for Brian because he had all these bills, you know. So it really he didn't, he kind of lost he lost a lot because you know he just wasn't able to pay everything. But um, of course he would have been pretty in pretty good shape here if he had the. Uh, so he would yes, need sir. about 150 an add-on. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, 250, I, I think would be ideal. You know, because his case, you know, with everything he went through, is probably worth it more than just the, you know, the medical bills and lost wages. His case would be worth more than that. So. Is there anything useful or valuable about offset? And in what situation um, would you ever want to have offset? That's true. I mean, it's just cheaper. You okay, know, it's just cool. cheaper. That's why people say, well, if you get this, it's a little cheaper. And that's, a lot of folks folks are trying to save money when they're buying insurance, but that's not where you want to save. You know, that's the thing that's really going to protect you, and that's really why, you know, you buy insurance, to you know, protect you in such an event. So. Now, in cases in the motorcycle world, if it's your fault or his fault, you're the one that gets hurt. So would motorcycle protection actually work for you in this case? Yeah, absolutely. I mean... You know, I mean, we're talking about a situation where, like, if you're riding a motorcycle and someone causes you, you know, to fall or, you know, injures you, uh, that person may have the basic coverage. They may just have 25000 But if you're on the motorcycle, you cover yourself by having this UM coverage. You, you know, you see the problem I'm saying? I mean, you, you get uh, the benefit of having 200000 in, in uninsured motorists to cover you because the other driver's insurance is not enough to cover you. Like I said, especially for motorcycles, because you, you might be out of everything 
it, it's, it wasn't your fault. It, 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 it is your fault. You're the one getting hurt. Right, and you're more likely to get hurt on a motorcycle, oh, yeah. of course, right? So that's that's why it's all more important for folks. So Brian was rear-ended, you said? Or? Brian was rear-ended, yes. So what, why didn't you sue? Well, the, the, the problem the was all he had medical. was a 25, you know? All, he, all the other driver had was 25,000. So you there was no addition. You just the insurance company, and that's not the person. Okay. That's right. That's all they're going to pay. And, right. you know, beyond that, they didn't have any money to really pursue, so... You know, so this is just how to protect yourself, and it's um, you know just something that you know you don't always think about when you buy it. But uh, it's something insurance companies certainly know. Or, you know. It looks tricky though, because it looks like they didn't even have the state minimum. Well, they had the state minimum, the twenty-five thousand. It's been the state minimum since 1983, and the at fault had the twenty-five thousand minimum, and then Brian just had the uninsured motors of twenty-five thousand. So that offset against the other drivers. But Brian's own uh, Allstate, his liability and all that, well, he's not liable with the collision and comprehensive, his wouldn't go in and cover that? that did, this just helps on the property damage on the car. So like his car, if the other guy didn't have insurance, you know, 25,000 would have just paid to fix his car or mm -hmm. if it's totaled, then they just pay him for the car. That's where, you know, collision comes in. So anyway. Well, you know, like I say, we give free audits, so, you know, anybody that has questions about how much coverage they should have or, you know, whether whether you, you feel you might be underinsured because, um, you know, like I say, you don't want to be in this situation and, you know, not have enough when you need it. All right. Thank you. So I appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks for the food. I know more hands-on exercises. We're going to do the helmet removals and we're going to do rescue breathing. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and show a little video that we have for the helmet removal as well. So we'll just do that real quick and then we'll head on over and get a little hands on practice. You deal with the conditions. Okay. All right. So um, rescuer one, rescuer two. So Bob's going to go ahead and take control of the head from the top. He's going to place his hands on the side of the helmet and also try to assess if he's breathing or not. We don't think he's breathing. We're not seeing any rise in the chest. And if he had a visor on there, we would probably not see it fogging up there. Okay? So as rescuer two, I'm gonna bring a hand, reach in here, undo his strap. All right, see if that makes any difference. He's still not breathing. I'm gonna go ahead and wait till I take control. All right, so now I'm gonna place a hand behind the neck and one on his chin. All right, I'm going to let Bob know that he's he can now release and actually start working the helmet off. And what I'm doing is I'm taking the things that hold the straps on and pulling them way out to the side to help get it away from the ears and then tip this forward, trying to get it over his nose. And he'll kind of walk the helmet off back and forth between forward and back. And my lower yeah, hand is following behind the head. And now I'm holding the head. There's a uh, sheet over there on the chair behind me to fill the gap. All right. All right. But now I've, I've got the whole weight of its head because that gap where the helmet was has been removed, allowing him to insert something underneath. We can slowly lower a little bit. And now you can take control of the head again. All right? The first thing I think was the jaw for us. Well, now you just maintain that position. Because since I'm on the side, it would be ideal for me to go ahead and do the jaw thrust and do the rescue breathing. And he could still maintain control of the head from his position. Okay? But I'm not going to do that. <laughs> not I, was, I was going to decline the rescue brace. <laughs> DNR. 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 <laughs> okay? So. Um, Did I really squash your nose? No, no, you, no, not at all. No, no, okay. No. And it was so it the idea well is, is you want to kind of walk the helmet off a little bit, you know, make sure that you're not taking the nose with it, and being able to walk it out. And the person behind is following the back, right below the helmet, until they actually are in the back of the skull. And then you can fill that gap. And then that rescuer one, after they got rid of the helmet, they can fill the gap and then get control. And then rescuer two could come over. Start doing the rescue breathing. If 
if breathing has not resumed. Okay? Cool. All right. Um, so if you want to pair with somebody, I've got some helmets here. Uh, you're welcome to use those. There's uh, multiple size, at least one of each size, between medium and extra, extra large. Okay, honestly. All right. All right. Hey, so we're picked up. It's here. here. So you want to rotate, here, here. rotate it until it's in alignment. Okay. All right. Oh, Lift the visor over. Head. Try to assess whether he's breathing or not. Just flip the yeah. All right. All right. So you're watching the chest, seeing if it rises, yeah. if there's not okay. any, any breath coming out here. All right. First assessing that. All right. And nothing coming out, so you can go ahead and release the chin strap. the head upward. Right. But when you think of no, <laughs> right. <laughs> all right. Still check, checking to see if there's any breath because it could be just release that chin strap to help out, right? All right, place one hand on the knee. What you might even do is rest your elbow against your knee. Okay, at this point, should they go ahead and take his glasses off? Yeah. Now it's something that's helpful. I didn't tell if you didn't. All right. Okay, so one hand there, one hand up here on the chin. All right. So then you now you can let her know she can release it. All right, you yeah, pull it out. No, she wants to. You want to kick your hands up here to the straps. Yeah, the straps. Right pull them out. Pull the straps out. Airway. So place this on here. I'll go use now. Place my thumbs on the mask to hold it in place, mm -hmm. and I can still is push on the jaw. Two breaths. Yes. Six seconds. And if you see, if I don't open up the jawway, what's going to happen? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> so you need to make sure that you open up that jawway. Okay? So if you don't see the chest moving, you're not doing it. Then. That's right. <laughs> you're not getting any air in there because it would raise the chest. It makes sense. So what's the count? Five? Seconds. First, two, two breaths, and then five seconds, five seconds between each breath. And these are some alcohol wipes, so we can wipe it down before the next person gets on there. All right. So you're just trying to push on the jaw. Yeah, that way. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right, so then put the mask on there. Can you over inflate somebody's lungs? You could. So you want to wash to see how how much. It so doesn't take much to. What happens to the person that you do that? Does that make um, them black out or is it? No, it's just that if you've got a chest injury, you can create well, tension, like, like right a deep tension deep pneumothorax. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yep. Mm -hmm. And it's just moving. Mm -hmm. Yep. Shoot about breathing the ear chest is moved too. Oh, this thing. You're done with it, right? Uh, yeah, you're done with that piece. And you can finish with the other rest of it. And you have the other one. Get the other one down. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Dealing with uh, obviously with uh, chest injury that might be causing a big breathing issue. Well, obviously they, you might see signs of them coughing or spitting up blood. So this is going to be one of those cases where you probably need to roll them on their side, let them spit it up. I mean, and, and get it out of the way or having difficulty breathing. They could be anxious or disoriented. You might see pale blue lips, or they might be sucking air. One common issue that they might experience when they've had an accident is maybe something punctured at their lung. So then you've got sucking air, and what you need to do is be able to control that as well. You know, we consider that 
you know, you've got a rib cage that's around the lungs and the area for the heart and the diaphragm. So the structure helps protect the lungs and the heart and also gives structure to the chest. Any damage to a rib could cause them to damage the lungs or cause problem expanding or contracting and the diaphragm below the lungs must remain intact in order for those lungs to work properly. It's all something similar to this picture before where we talked about that when that initial compressing was that the, the spine actually may have compressed on the lungs and the heart inside. Well, that might also have caused some of the, the bones in the rib cage to actually break and cause your frail chest, which will make it hard to diff and difficult to breathe. So how would we help that out? Is if they got something you know, to help them support it? Because right now, if, if they got several ribs, then there's nothing to help support that. So if they took maybe a vest or something, or a blanket or something, just have them hold it in here to help provide that compression. That'll help them breathe a lot better. Yeah, no pressure, just have them roll something up and just hold it under the arm for support. Or a suck and chest wound, you could actually, if, if you could see the wound, take like a Ziploc bag and tape several sides of it and allow a space for air to be able to escape. So we need to leave it open. No, well, they changed that, didn't they? To, to just, if we used to be put a bag over it and then leave a corner on tape, or you may just need to leave it open um, to allow them to breathe. Yeah, can't say I understand it. Yeah, because I know that was the, the way we used to do it, was to tape. Like take like three sides of the bag and leave one side so that it actually releases the air. Treatment for chest injuries. If they want, let them sit up. Let them be able to sit, talk. And when you're dealing with someone, try to have a nice calm voice. Also, this is probably not the best, might not be the best way to talk to the person, but you know, if they're propped up against somebody, then another rescuer can come around the front of them and actually talk to them. That way they're not trying to move their head around, which is, you know, we're still worried about that spinal injury as well. So if, you, if you're talking to them straight at, then they don't have to turn that head to go see you. So the person's reaction is to tend to, to turn their head and look at you. Encourage them to breathe slowly. And just be prepared if they should become unconscious and then you need to go back and do rescue breathing. I mean, doesn't, doesn't mean, you know, we might have got, got them, did rescue breathing, got them breathing again, but they could go back to the state where they became unconscious and wasn't able to do their own breathing. And don't try to do rescue breathing on a person that's conscious. They're going to fight you a little bit. Another issue we worry about is circulation. So after getting the airway and the breathing, we need to obviously scan the body looking for any kind of bleeding. Loss of circulation and trauma typically comes from bleeding, and it may not be something that you can actually see though. If it's internal, we're not gonna be able to see it as a bystander. But if you've got like a limb, you saw some type of bleeding there. Things you could do is remove jewelry, provide direct elevation, provide compression. Either by direct pre pressure on, on an artery or else direct pressure over top of the wood. And you could take like just a four by four or some type of cloth and place it over top of it and apply the pressure. Don't be removing it though. Once you've applied it on there, leave it on there. Pressure dressing. So we would place a sterile dressing directly over top of that area that's bleeding and hold direct pressure. Do not remove the first dressing and then just add additional dressings and bandanas, whatever, to add pressure. And then wrap with gauze to make sure that it's not so tight that it forms a tourniquet. 
Okay. A lot of things that have been coming out on the market are hemostatic dressings. These can be used to provide direct pressure and elevation when that, those things fail and are unable to be used due to the area of the wound. You might see them by a brand name called Quick Clot or Celex. Uh, but best to use those with a clotting agent rather than the powder. Make sure you're using gloves when you're dealing with a blood, blood circulation situation especially over other surfaces, and don't touch other surfaces, especially the eyes. Tourniquets. So what we would use a tourniquet, though, is if we're not able to stop the bleeding through direct pressure. You know, it, it's like a lot of bleeding going on. But a tourniquet should be used after attempting to control the bleeding, direct pressure, and when the direct pressure is not an option, such as a crushed limb or when addressing multiple issues. So how would you do a tourniquet? Well, we're going to do, going to do a little practice on that. Uh, so what we want to take a look at, though, is you know you got a spot where you can actually stop the crush, the flow of the blood by putting a dressing across it. And then you can take a stick and twist the stick to actually apply the pressure and then take another bandana or something to actually uh, hold it in place. And if we need more pressure, we can add like a bandage roll. So in your little student packs, Actually, take it, put it around the arm, we can tie a knot in it. What I'm going to do is take a pen, take one out of my pocket. Oh gosh, I even got it. And then tie over the pen. All right. Now we want to apply more pressure, we can just twist it. And we thought we needed more pressure, you can use like a bandage roll. Place that underneath. Turn it. And then to hold it in place, use another bandage to hold it in place. Okay? So if you want to try to do that, you're welcome to. You're waiting right there. <laughs> And then this would apply more pressure by twisting it, and then it has a hook here to hold it in place, and you can mark the time. Oh, that's cool. That's nice. And honestly, these things are Amazon 12 bucks. I'm going to do this for your dad, and I'll send it back to you. That sounds good. Yeah, your dad's picture was at three quarters. Yeah, like that. So I did a live focus. Okay, so let's keep the plan about tourniquets, though. Remember that the tourniquet is being used to cut off the blood supply to the limb. So you want to try general blood management first, which is pressure dressing or, or you know, and then use a wide band so it's not going to cut off the tissue. Uh, record the time that it was placed on there. Once placed, don't remove it, and apply enough pressure to actually stop the bleed. But like I was mentioning to them is that, you know, there's been a lot of development in the use of tourniquets, especially when we deal with military use as well, 
and then they've also found out well you know that they're still able to to recover limbs and things like that as well if, if you know a tourniquet was applied so don't think that just because you're applying a tourniquet they're going to actually lose that limb broken bone injuries you know you may find that you're going to need to actually expose the bones to be able to assess it so you know when you're doing your head and toe assessment you know you've got trauma shears that you would be able to cut the pants leg open and be able to, to actually see that especially if you saw that all of a sudden underneath that pants leg that there was a blood spot or something you probably need to investigate further and see what that is uh, but it's only life-threatening if the bone is broken that severs an artery all right if it's just you know, small bleeding, then it's probably not going to be like a threat. Okay. And then on the scene, you know, you might need to do some type of splinting. I know, you know, for you guys being out in the woods and things like that, you're probably going to be resorting to something out there in the woods, find some splints, carry some bandanas, you know, at least then you could tie those on there to help split the broken bone. Also, you may you know, need to create a manual split by placing your hands above and below the suspected break. How many of you carry something like this in your motorcycle? You know, if you go to any of the motorcycle shops, they probably have some of these magazines here. Maybe you can use that as a splint as well. So consider that as if when you're, what you have in your motorcycle. And also then support below or above, above and below the broken bone. Once you support it, you can apply an ice pack. Ice packs. You can find these pretty commonly in various places. That one's been around so long. Yeah, that one's been around too long. <laughs> or it's been used. I think that one's been used. Actually, it is chilling. It is chilling. So ice packs might be something nice to add to a kid as well. Shock. So we have various types of shock, usually related to some type of loss of fluid. You know, and then of course you'd be treating externally, and then you might have to consider some internal bleeding. It could be some head injury, could be even a psychological response to a trauma but everyone at the scene will suffer some type of psychological shock. Shock, you might want to consider, consider the severity of the abdominal injuries are often, often underestimated and consider, you know, how much blood would be in there. That's one liter of blood be in the abdominal cavity. You know, persons might be having vague complaints of pain, nausea, and dizziness. You know, but then you know, go back and consider the mechanisms of injury that we talked about earlier. You know, what may have happened, how did they end up getting off their motorcycle or be injured? You know, so we need to consider that if we're going to be thinking that there might be an abdominal injury that you know, someone needs to, to address. Trauma to the abdomen. Abdomen can cause serious bleeding or infections. So then two liters of blood could, lost, could be lost in the abdomen and the pelvis. But if you find that the skin is still intact, then it's going to still stay a sterile environment. Right? We're only, you know, considering if, if it gets exposed, 
but then it's going to become unsterile. Such as this. So to, you know, or you call it the guts are hanging out. Signs and symptoms of shock. You might find that person is restless or irritable, or their level of consciousness keeps going in and out. Spin, you know, pale, cool, moist skin, rapid breathing, rapid pulse, or excessive thirst. Even hypothermia might cause shock. We you know, you've heard that you know, in order to deal with the various types of climates. You need to dress in layers, right? But we may become, you know, dealing with shock, especially when we look at the wind chill chart. And you know, as you're riding along, they could be dealing with below freezing temperatures, just over 15 miles per hour, and at 45 degrees out, you know, the temperature drops down below down to 29 degrees. So what do we do for shock? We don't replace any protruding organs. We don't allow that person to eat or drink. We just have, have them lay flat, raise their, leg, raise their legs or bend their uninjured legs, and just stay calm. That will help calm them down, cover them, keep them warm. That's where the blankets will come in handy. And don't allow them to eat or drink or anything. treatments for shock, for internal bleeding, make sure they're staying dry, shelter them from the wind, cover them, keep them warm. Don't forget about the neck and the head area to cover them up and then if available put chemical hot packs in the armpits, neck, groin areas, but don't place them directly on the skin. That could probably burn them. What injuries might consider that there's a head to help us consider that there might be a head injury? You know, if you see a wound on the scalp or a fracture or some bleeding or bruising, loss of consciousness, nasal discharge, or even a stiff neck. Swelling of the brain can cause pressure to the brain stem, which controls automatic functions like breathing. So this could be a problem that causes you then to, to lose breathing. You might have to consider um, that they may have some pressure to the, to the brain stem. Is this something we're going to be able to address as a bystander? No. But you're going to be trying to help them breathe, though, in the meantime. And a concussion is a head injury. Remember that this happens when the head when you know, your head impacts with something and then the brain is still moving around inside can cause that concussion. And numerous indications that there might be a concussion. Right. You don't see any pressure. No pressure to the head, don't block the flow of blood. Uh, there might be some fractures, but it may not bleed. You know, just put dressing over top of it, right? We're not putting a lot of pressure on there. Just, just light, loosely wrap around it. And then stay calm. Remember, you as a responder, your emotions could try to probably run high. So you want to try to keep them in check, keep your voice calm and reassuring, letting them know that help is on the way, they're going to be okay. But be firm and don't yell unless it's absolutely necessary. And even touching a person may calm them down. You know, even if, but if they, if they do not object, 
and talk to them even if they're unconscious. They may still be able to hear you even though you don't think that they're conscious. That's why we're saying don't cover those ears up, especially when you're working with them as well. So for more treatment, you just want to watch for changes in their condition, keep talking to the person, gather their information, try not to lift the head to place anything underneath, and try not to restrain the person, instead protect them from injuring themselves. So you want to be around them if, if, if they decide they want to get up and start moving around, but just try to protect them. Be, you know, if you see something that they might be going to that might be, you know, maybe cause them more injury, try to protect them from going into that area. Or even if, if all of a sudden you see them collapse, see if you can actually help them and uh, not let them fall too hard. Spine motion restriction. Now, your person may be complaining about tenderness in the area, numbness or weakness, paralysis or loss of feeling, or have trouble breathing or an inability to control their bladder or bowels. Spinal injuries could be dependent upon where the, the injury may have took place. A low back injury might affect their legs, while a high one might cause them to have, to have difficulty breathing. So you have to consider, you know, from the brain down, where the injury is. I mean, if they find you find that they're having trouble getting their breath, it could be something that's high in their back, or if they're just feeling like they don't have any feeling below their waist or something like that, then that, that could be a sign that the, there might be an injury lower down. As we talked about with spine, spinal movement restrictions, you know, to assist with it, but don't, but first approach the person at eye level. This is where I said you want to try to be in front of them, telling them what you want to do. Don't cover their ears. Keep your hands off their neck and assume a coverable position. So this person is actually taking a place behind them, letting the person rest up against them, but they're also maintaining control of the, the head from moving around. But trying not to let that person go yank their head and look over their shoulder. Talk to them in a calm voice. I found I had to be in this situation one time. We had an accident in Cleveland, Georgia. Um, and actually when the EMS got on the scene, they had me take that position behind them while they were assessing the person for a while. So in summary, what did we talk about? We talked about first preventing further injury. Who do you take care of first? Yourself. Yourself, right? Don't go rushing in the scene, take personal precautions. Wear protective gear. Make sure that you're not having anything, you know, to, to, to get contaminated with. Also that you don't just run in, in front of traffic. Try to help protect the scene as well. All right, we want to assess the situation. Take only a few seconds to make that assessment, but also start making contact to EMS as quickly as possible so that we can talk about, you know, what they, you know, EMS needs to do, get them on the scene as quickly as possible so they can meet their objective of trying to have that person packaged up and on their way to a hospital where they may need surgery to deal with their trauma. Make contact the EMS. You need to make the call to the ERD operator. Think about the acronym SAMPLE. Uh, you know, if you're able to talk to the person, see if you can find out what that situation was, what caused their injuries, what they may have experienced. And then we want to treat them with life-sustaining care. Where the airway, we're administering a jaw thrust. If they need us to help them with their airway, and then doing the rescue breathing, giving them the two breaths, and then one every six seconds. Circulation by controlling the bleeding, if we what we can see, because obviously anything internal, we're not able to see that. And then dealing with shock 
bleed, which is ca probably caused by bleeding you can't see or psychogenic condition and then spinal motion restriction. Any questions at that point? Is there anything? I mean, I'm trying to went through that a little quickly. Is there anybody think they got any questions on that? Yeah, you know, we were mostly dealing with what we can see as 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 a bystander. We can't assume you know anything that we can't see. Uh, all right. uh, access scene management through Road Guardian membership is one way you could help support our program. Um, there's a way you can sign in at roadguardians.org and get some more resources <coughs> about finding out motorcycle related resources. Um, they have a program where you can get rewards and discounts in um, several you know, motorcycle related things, travel, motorcycle parts. Um, and then there's even a policy for accidental death and disability <coughs> insurance, uh, dollars off of events and online ASF training. And then you can show your support by you'll be getting a we'll be getting an Uncle Road Guardian patch, apparel, and yearly pins, and show your commitment to lifelong learning. Okay. And if you want more, we offer an advanced program. We had kind of backed off on doing that. Uh, which would be normally, you know, every year or every two years when we've been offering it. Uh, it you could actually do it in, if taken within two years of a basic class. We just completed the basic class here. Uh, refresher classes, after completing the basic and advanced classes, we'll keep your skills refreshed by doing a four hour skill lab about once every two years, one to two years. And accident scene management is a 501 C3 tax exempt organizations so you can make tax exempt deductions by joining road guardians and attending fundraisers supported by partners. And that is the end of my presentation. Is there anything anybody's got any questions about? I was just curious if, if you ever had any actual experience that road emergencies that you had to uh, bring these things to play. Yeah, uh, there, there's been, t well, like I said, there was one, uh, an accident in Cleveland, Georgia. We had a couple motorcyclists, a uh, lady got rear-ended by a car, and uh, we stopped and assisted there. Nice. Uh, we've even used the, these types of things at the scene of a um, car accident you know, car and motorcycle accidents. And in fact, um, I did one time do that with my wife. She actually had an accident and um, I, res I was the one following her and treated her immediately. Well, were you able to contact uh, EMS? Okay, uh, well, so, you have any trouble with that? Someone else, we, it was actually, um, Near where the North New Northside Charity Hospital is in Kent, Georgia, but someone had stopped immediately afterwards, and they made the call to EMS. Oh, cool! And actually, they were a paramedic, so they had me take my hands off of her, and they took over for me. Oh, cool! Just because I was probably very close to the situation. Very cool. Well, but that's, that's but I mean, yeah, this, you know, the things that you learn here not only apply to motorcyclists, but as well to motor, motorists or, or any situation. Yeah, would be some time that this would come. You know, you asked that question, and because I ride around a lot for these events, um, I've come across a lot of accidents. But the thing, my biggest takeaway, advice I can give you guys, especially if you want to help, watch out for the other drivers around you, because a lot of people really don't care about the situation at all, and they're trying to get where they need to go faster and. Uh, than they were before the wreck. And they give two craps about the accident scene, they couldn't care less about you. And I've almost been hit four or five times 
trying to help someone at an accident scene. One of them was very serious, and I had a car speed in between us and the two wrecked cars, causing more damage to the car that was wrecked. Oh, wow. And they kept on going. One of them hit a gas line and created a bigger situation than it was even there originally. Oh, wow. So if you guys ever stop there's a situation like that, please, 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 please be cognizant of your surroundings and don't be just solely focused on the accident scene. You need absolute situational awareness at that time, especially if you're in a motorcycle wreck. Take your own helmet off first so you can see everything and then assess the situation from there. Because I can't tell you the times when I've stopped that I actually could have been a victim myself from somebody that didn't oh, want yeah. to stop at all. Oh, sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I mean, we've... I, I, We've had situations, well, my wife was actually, while she was in her EMT training, we stopped at an accident off of 140 and 411. Um, and I went ahead and, and went to directing traffic. And either standing out there with a vest on and waving people down, they didn't want to stop at all. And then they end up right there at that accident scene where there's even an ambulance sitting in the middle of the intersection. Yeah, like, oh, this is inconvenient. I'll just take someone's lawn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like well, I mean, the was a, there was a side road to direct them on, and then they still wanted to come right on by me and go right into that four-way intersection. So, I mean, you know, you need to be careful about yourself. Just 